We're going to talk today about how pain is the worst, or at least so we, we think a lot of times. And as difficult as pain is, it, making it the absolute worst thing is, is a one degree off idea. And uh, through this series, I've been showing you how one degree off can lead you in a, a different place. Um, so I have one more of those. Uh, last night, if any of you were watching the game, there was kind of a historic moment in baseball. The Cubs actually won and are going to the pennant. And let's say you were going to travel to Wrigley Field to, to see that, that game la- last night. So this would be, this would be the, the route that you would take, a direct route there, um, provided, you, let's say you had a, a helicopter or an airplane or something like that. From this spot to Wrigley Field is... Is that, that would be the route that you'd take. And uh, once you hit the next one, if you go 109.8 miles at 232.568 degrees, you will arrive at Wrigley Field from this exact spot right here where we are. But let's say you went one degree off. One degree off, you'd end up at the Nature Museum. So... You'd either be, one degree off would mean the difference of seeing a, a historic moment in baseball and a really exciting game also, to looking at, at leaves and sticks at, at a nature museum. And not just a nature center, a nature museum, so you'd be looking at old leaves and sticks too. <laughs> one degree off, quite a, different, quite a different place you'll end up there. Well... We pick up ideas from the culture that we live in, and we can easily find ourselves one degree off from the directions that that God gives us. Let's look at uh, the screen here, and let's say our memory verse together. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2, and take it away. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And uh, there's still bracelets available. If you didn't get one, you want one, or if you want an extra one, please, by all means, take it today. In our culture today, we act like pain is the worst thing in the world. Like that's the, the absolute worst thing, the, what, we, what we have to avoid. This is the worst thing. Now, I want to definitely say we don't, we, nobody wants to suffer. Pain isn't a, exactly a good thing. It's not something that we would seek out or, or want by any means. If you have a, a headache or, or a stomach ache, take something by, by all means. Um, once in a while, I'll, I'll get a headache and I'll feel just really tired and, and I'll be laying down and, and Deirdre will say, did you take anything yet? And I'll be like, no. So you have to, you have to when, when you're not feeling well, take something. There's nothing wrong with that. Because there's a lot of pain that's just completely unnecessary. It just gets in the way. It does us no good at all. But sometimes in our quest to avoid pain, we will sin. We will sin to avoid pain. I've read recently about how, how, uh, how many opioid addictions there are in this country right now and how the number of prescriptions for those kind of painkillers has just skyrocketed and the amount of people that are either addicted to them or misusing them is extremely high. In the last 15 years, more than 165,000 people have died from, from overdoses on those medications, such as Oxycontin, Vicodin, and Percocet. Now, there are some people who need those, and that's the only thing that's going to get rid of their pain, but it's, it's, pretty, it's becoming a, a national health concern that more people are using them than need them, and people are misusing them at quite an alarming rate. The quest to avoid pain. 
There's an expression that I've used and I've heard other people use before where, you know, somebody has, has died and, and uh, the expression is, at least he didn't suffer. Now, again, we, we don't want people to suffer, but it's interesting that we say, at least he didn't suffer. Like, death is okay as long as they didn't suffer. It's like, that is suffering the absolute worst thing? It's when pain is the worst that life starts to lose its value. And there's a lot of evidence for this. Suicides are going up. They're still going up. They've been going up for many years. Suicides surpassed traffic deaths in 2010. And they're still pulling away from them. Um, there's a lot of high-profile people who are just suffering and they decide to, to, that it's not worth it anymore. Robin Williams would be one. He had a terrible disease and life was getting worse and so he just decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done now. And there's more and more places that are adopting laws to allow for assisted suicide. But they don't call it that. That doesn't sound very nice. They call it an end-of-life option or death with dignity now. When pain is the worst, life loses its value. There's a picture I, I have up here. Who recognizes that person? Anybody? A couple people? This is Brittany Maynard. She was a 29-year-old. Um, in 2014, she was diagnosed with stage 4 brain cancer. She was given six months to live. She lived in California, and she decided that she didn't want to have to suffer through that cancer. She moved to Oregon, where they have a death with dignity law, so that she could die on her own terms. Her, this is what she said, the worst thing that could happen to me is that I wait too long because I'm trying to seize each day because I somehow have my autonomy taken away from me by my disease because of the nature of my cancer. Suffering and pain is, is the worst here. It's worse than death. Life loses its value. There's another picture that I have on the screen here. Who recognizes this person? One, two, three, okay, a few people do. Yeah, okay. This is Johnny Erickson Tata. Here's somebody who's experienced quite a bit of pain in her life and quite a bit of loss. When Brittany Maynard was talking about how she was going to end her life on her terms to avoid a bunch of suffering, Johnny Erickson Tata actually went on her radio show to plead with her to reconsider. And I love what she says here. I'm going to just read it. If I could park my wheelchair beside her, I would tell her how the love of Jesus has sustained me through my chronic pain, quadriplegia, and cancer. I don't want her to wake up on the other side of her tombstone only to face a dark, grim existence without life and joy, that is, without God. There's only one person who has transformed the landscape of life after death, and that is Jesus the one who conquered the grave, opening the path to life eternal. Three grams of phenobarbital in the veins will only provide a temporary reprieve. It is not the answer for the most important passage of her life. The hours are ticking away. Please, Brittany, open your heart to the only one who can do something about your pain and your death. Life is the most irreplaceable and found, fundamental condition of the human experience. So she's saying, hey, I've been through pain. I've been through loss. I've been through cancer too. Turn to Jesus, please. Brittany Maynard, 
she actually lived longer than those six months than she was prescribed to live, but she took those pills anyways on November 1, 2014, and she died. And these laws, they're only getting more and more expansive. In the Netherlands, they were the first country to legalize euthanasia in 2002. They have legislation now that's going to be proposed that that would allow people who to take their own lives who have who those who feel they have completed life but are not necessarily terminally ill. In Canada last year their supreme court unanimously ruled that laws against assisted suicide are unconstitutional and they mentioned something about intolerable suffering as being a reason to be able to kill yourself. Life loses its meaning, its value, when pain is the worst. The Bible tells us that there are worse things than suffering pain. It's not saying that it's a good thing or something we should seek, but there's worse things, for sure. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. It says here, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Verse 1 there. It says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. In Jesus' case here, the Spirit of God led him into the desert. I find that fascinating. We usually think that God wants us to to feel good and to be successful. and, And here, the Spirit is leading him into the desert. The word for desert there in, in Greek actually can also mean a lonely place, a deserted place, uninhabited, desolate, just a wasteland, a place where there's nothing. God, God doesn't tempt us, but He does allow those temptations to come. He does lead us to those places where we will be vulnerable to those temptations. It seems kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? Whether whether we like it or not, the Lord's path will lead through deserts. And as I'm looking out there, I'm I'm seeing a lot of people who've gone through a lot of deserts out there. And there's going to be more too. When we walk the path of Jesus, there's going to be deserts. It's going to be lonely. It's going to be dangerous. In the desert, you face dehydration, exhaustion, not to mention snakes and scorpions and things like that. And, it's, and the desert is painful. You have the sun that's beating down on you. 
That, I mean, sunburn is, is just the beginning of your problems. Heat stroke. The ground actually becomes as hot as a frying pan in some deserts at some times. God leads us through these places. And just because we go through them, we need to be ready that God is still there with us. In verse 2, it says he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. So he was in this wasteland, this desolate place all by himself and he had no food. He was not, he was fasting. He was hungry, it says. He was hungry. I want to just take a minute to reinforce that Jesus was a fully human being. Um, Everything that is true about us it was true about him except for the sin factor. But he had a stomach. He had a body. His stomach would be empty. It would feel hungry. And after not eating for that long, his body would start to break down, just like ours would. Actually, after 40 days of fasting, Jesus' hunger would be near starvation. I read about one guy who actually tried to fast for 40 days just like Jesus did and and he didn't make it. He died. Jesus is probably near death here or approaching that. And there are people who have lasted more than 40 days without food. If you're properly dehydrated, if you're dehydrated, then, then that number goes out the window. But there's a lot of pain that goes with hunger. If you, if you look it up, I mean, we don't really know what it's like to be hungry like this. But there's a lot of pain that goes with hunger. If you're hungry like this, that hurts. There's a proverb, Irish proverb, that says, The full person does not understand the needs of the hungry. When we read that Jesus was hungry, we usually think of the hunger that we experience when we haven't had a meal for a number of hours. There was a study that was done on, there were 36 men, and they, they fed them for a week to maintain their body weight, and then they cut that diet in half. And they went on for uh, a number of weeks, maybe even a couple months, with 36 guys with half their diet to see what would happen. So six months These men became obsessed with food. They talked food. They daydreamed food. They collected recipes. These people weren't cooks or anything, but suddenly they're collecting recipes. They were reading cookbooks. They lost interest in any former activities that they had before. There was one guy who said, if we see a movie, the most interesting part of it is contained in the scenes where people are eating. I couldn't laugh at even the funniest picture in the world. When you're hungry, that that messes with your mind. And these people were still eating. They were just living on half of a diet. The body uses food for its every function. Everything that, that we do or we have as a body, that's because of food. If you take food away, the body just starts to shut down. Once carbs are used up, then your body starts breaking down the fat. And once the fat's broken down, then it starts to break down your organs. And you have mental fatigue. The bodily symptoms of starvation are all over the place because the body just can't function anymore. And then there's your immune system. If you're starving, you can die of a common cold because your immune system can't keep up. Jesus was in incredible pain when it says 40 days he was hungry. And his mind would have been at his weakest point. And then verse 3, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Satan's temptation here is one degree off. If bad, even. This temptation is really fascinating to me. What is wrong with this? 
is it wrong to eat? Jesus was going to later multiply food for tons of other people. He can't feed himself once? Is it wrong to eat when when you're hungry or, in his case, starving? What was so bad about this temptation? What good is a starving Messiah to anyone? Eat something. You're the Son of God. He says, if you are the Son of God. Kind of saying there, you deserve better here. You're the Son of God. You deserve more than this. You deserve to eat. You're the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. That means He's here to serve. In, in, the, in the kingdom of God, when you have a position or power or authority, that doesn't mean you use it for yourself. That means you are there to serve somebody else. Any power or position or privilege that we have that, that God has given to us, that means we're supposed to serve somebody else or others. If you are the Son of God, use your power, your privilege for yourself. It's just a little degree off. Satan tries to get Jesus to claim his rights over completing his mission. He wants him to use his position to serve himself. And again, I want to reinforce how Jesus' mind would have been functioning under these conditions. There's a book that I read by a guy who actually spent many years in one of the North Korean gulag camps. And the normal people there are starving. Let alone the people who are in the prison camps there. This is what he says. Hunger quashes man's will to help his fellow man. I've seen fathers steal food from their children's own lunch boxes. As they scarf down the corn, they have only one overpowering desire to placate even just for one moment that feeling of insufferable need. Jesus would have been at that point. That point where any one of us would even steal food from our own children. Satan targets us when we are weak, when we are isolated, when we're hurting, when we're in pain. When our mind is at the brink, when we can't think straight very well, that's when he comes at us with temptations. That's when he offers us something that will relieve us, something nice, something helpful. Jesus was at his weakest and Satan was there with relief. You're the son of God. Eat something. Wouldn't that be great to eat something? It seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? In him in this situation, the Spirit's way is a hungry desert. And Satan's way is food and relief from starvation. What's, what's wrong with that picture? All the more to mess with our minds and to get us to do something that's wrong. It's when God leads us through pain and the devil offers us relief that our compass gets thrown off. Especially when Satan offers you that just one degree off option there. It's just, just, just a little bit off. That's where we're vulnerable. That's where Satan gets us and that's where he gets that foot in the door because if we will go one degree off, we'll go two. And if we'll go two, we'll go four. And so on. My dad had this saying when he wanted us to eat the food even if we didn't like it. He would say, nobody ever starved in the presence of food. Well, that would mean that you have to eat this whether you like it or not and too bad. 
Jesus could have put food in front of himself like that, and he was starving. Satan came at him with food, with that relief. Let's avoid pain here. But his third temptation was the knockout. In verse 9, All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Here Satan offers Jesus the chance to be king without the cross. Jesus knows what his mission is. Satan knows what his mission is. And Satan says, how would you like to have that throne, that crown, that authority to rule without that pain? You can bypass that. You could still get that. You can just do it a little easier. How would you like that? Can you imagine how tempting that would have been? You could bypass the cross and still get what you wanted. The cross is the pinnacle of pain. It's, as one song we sing says, it's the emblem of suffering and shame. How would you like to bypass that? Isn't pain the worst? Why don't you, why don't you go the other way? I, I've, I've got this nice way for you here. Satan's a really good salesman, isn't he? I've got this nice alternative path here for you, and it'll get you the same thing that you want. It'll just cost less. These are the temptations that Jesus faced. If pain was the worst, Jesus would have done what Satan said. If pain were the worst, then Jesus would have no reason to turn Satan down. He would have gone with this. He would have fed himself. He would have produced bread for himself. He would have taken that alternative route to ruling and bypassed the cross. If pain was the worst, Jesus had no reason to turn Satan down at all. This is the one degree off temptation that he faced. What's striking to me is that under that much pressure, even though it was only just a little bit off, even Jesus didn't cave. He didn't cave. He chose the pain because there are worse things out there. As awful as pain is, there's worse things. Jesus chose the pain. There are worse things. And those worse things are hit on in the way Jesus responds. So, for example, verse 4. It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The worst is not living by God's word. That's the worst. When we start to live on our own and go our own way and not listen to God anymore, that's the worst. The worst is relying on ourselves instead of God. The worst is thinking that we live by food. That the main part of life is a material existence, not spiritual things, not heavenly things. There were people, there was a crowd that Jesus fed and they followed him after he fed them. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you were looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. There's bigger things out there than even food. Verse 7, Jesus answered him, It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The worst is not trusting God. The worst thing out there is to, to not trust God, to think that God might not keep His promises, that maybe God isn't reliable, or trying to prove yourself instead of letting God prove Himself through you. Satan was saying, throw yourself down, prove yourself, instead of letting God prove himself through you. That's our temptation too. Prove yourself, instead of letting God prove himself through you. He 
The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians says, There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The worst is not trusting God. Trying to prove yourself. Verse 10. Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. The worst is worshiping anything else alongside the one true God. The worst is to have our hearts belong to another God or anything else, even comparably to the one true God. That's the worst. Idolatry is the worst. Jesus healed a man in John chapter 5. He couldn't walk this man for 38 years. He healed this man, and then once this man was healed and walking around and everything, Jesus said this to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. There are worse things than not even being able to walk for 38 years, being sick for 38 years. There's worse things than that. Let's look at the screen here together. And let's answer this question. What does the Lord require in the first commandment? That I, not wanting to endanger my very salvation, avoid and shun all idolatry, magic, superstitious rites, and prayer to saints or to other creatures, that I sincerely acknowledge the only true God Trust Him alone. Look to Him for every good thing, humbly and patiently. Love Him, fear Him, and honor Him with all my heart. In short, that I give up anything rather than go against His will in any way. That includes pain. That I give up anything rather than go against His will in any way. That's the worst. Jesus was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, it says in Isaiah 53. His entire life says pain is not the worst. His, his whole example says pain is not the worst. The worst is to live in sin and to be apart from God. To be separated from God, to be estranged from Him, to be apart Jesus endured the worst pain that we can possibly offer so that we would be saved from a fate worse than that. One more time, Johnny Erickson Tata. I would tell her how the love of Jesus has sustained me through my chronic pain, quadriplegia, and cancer. I don't want her to wake up on the other side of her tombstone, only to face a dark, grim existence without life and joy, that is, without God. That's the worst. I want to say it again. It's not wrong to avoid pain. It's not wrong to, to take pills when, when you're hurting and suffering. But when pain causes us to sin gone too far. When pain causes us to worship anything else besides God or to rely on ourselves to not trust Him, too far. Jesus didn't cave. We don't have to cave either. We can do what He wants. We can do the right thing no matter how much it hurts. That's what His whole life says to us. Jesus and the cross say to us, we can face any pain that we need to face. It's better to face any pain than to sin, than to be apart from God, than to not trust Him, than to worship anything else besides Him. Those are the worst things. He is the one true God who saves us from fates worse than the worst pain. Let's bow our heads and let's pray.
Lord God in heaven, Lord, there's a lot of pain in this world. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of anguish. And Lord, it's, it's, it's terrible what happens here. We pray, O oh Lord, that as awful as that is, that we would never lose sight of things that even worse than that. Being estranged from you, to reject you, to go our own ways, to sin, to be apart from you. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would keep you firmly in our sights by the power of Jesus who said no, who didn't cave, even though he was under great pain. We pray, O oh Lord, that whatever we suffer, whatever deserts that you might lead us in this life, that we would never cave in that, Lord. We would keep our eyes focused on you, the cross, and the hope of eternal life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.